This is CBC Here and Now. If the divided camp gets another person, they can rule the administration. Deep divisions on Bell Island. Wabana Mayor Gary Gazine pleads for unity. Where we are in that critical zone, it's, it's a very uh, precarious place to be. Cod stocks are down for the first time in years. DFO is sounding the alarm. Music is a gift that he gave us, and uh, he was so passionate about uh, songs and storytelling, and he's but an accordion. Beloved Newfoundland musicians, the Ennis sisters pay tribute to their late father. Well, what a day, 10 degrees and sun in the east, nearly 30 centimeters of snow in the west. But what's in store for the weekend? Looking at more flurries and some strong winds. Details coming up. We start tonight on Bell Island, where what seems to be a never-ending cycle of controversy continues. There have been accusations of power grabs, threats of legal action, and in some cases, outright hostility in parking lots. And caught in the middle of all this is Wabana Mayor Gary Gazine, who's making what can only be described as a long-shot call for unity. Here now's Terry Roberts has this report. It's been a little bit stressful. My family's concerned. Gary Gazine is not so steady on his feet. He's battling the effects of diabetes. But it's not the only issue weighing heavily on his shoulders. I was thinking about stepping down, but I think I owe it to the people to try to hang around. Wabana is divided, here in the council chamber, and among those involved with groups like Tourism Bell Island and Radio Bell Island. Controversy is nothing new here, but the current atmosphere is especially tense. I can't see this place getting any worse than what it is. I've never seen anything like the division that there is now amongst our community. Don Inglehart is a longtime volunteer, former employee with the town and Tourism Bell Island, says she's fallen out of favor with those wielding power and believes that leaves her with few options. It's gotten to the point where um, I'll own my own home in 14 months and I've come to the conclusion that I'm just going to sell and leave. Inglehart says she was verbally assaulted by a town councillor for clicking like on a Facebook post. It was a full-on attack. Uh, he was angry. I was scared. I was being tailgated by, by people, you know, in a threatening way in my vehicle. Kelly Russell left Wabana last fall, tired of the controversy related to Radio Bell Island and his role as station manager. It's, it's the one thing that um, I'm really proud of, and it's also the one thing that uh, I most regret doing in my life. This is the name that keeps emerging in all the controversy. Henry Crane is a central figure with several important groups on the island, singled out for criticism in a mediator's report that failed to end the acrimony, but he refused an interview. If you want to know where a lot of us pen our ideas to, it, it's Mr. Henry Crane. How so? He continuously, for what we feel, blocks everything. Crane may be a lightning rod for criticism, but he's not backing down writing on a Facebook post that I won't be bullied, won't be threatened, and can't be intimidated. Radio Bell Island is located right here in the high school, and tensions could escalate on Saturday when those critical of the board that runs it meet to vent their frustrations. We want accountability. Gary Gazine does too, but above all else, he wants harmony. We want to make Bell Island a happy place. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Wabana. Police confirm that a 21-year-old man died in yesterday's supper hour car crash on Pitts Memorial Drive. Two cars traveling west collided near the intersection at Richard Nolan Drive in Mount Pearl. One vehicle then struck a utility pole. The car that struck the pole was carrying three men. All were taken to hospital. The driver died during the night. And the two passengers have serious but non-life-threatening injuries. There's no word yet on what caused the crash. St. Bonaventure's College has fired its staff accountant and police are investigating what the private school calls a significant misappropriation of funds. The St. John School sent out a statement today saying it only found out about the alleged fraud in the last three days and that it is shocked and disappointed. A staff accountant has been terminated effective immediately and St. Bonds has hired a lawyer. It plans to have an independent forensic audit done. The statement says the full extent of the misappropriation is not yet known, but it says school operations won't be affected. Police in St. John's are investigating a historical sexual assault complaint that dates back, that dates back rather to 1981. 
The allegation is against a doctor who was employed by the RCMP. The RNC says the allegation was prompted by a police investigation in Halifax, and that investigation involved complaints of sexual assault by a doctor doing medical exams on potential RCMP recruits. Those alleged incidents took place between 1981 and 2003. The RNC says so far no charges have been laid. Troubled times for the province's cod stocks. Federal fisheries officials gave an update on northern cod this morning, and the news isn't good. As here and now's Janelle Kelly reports, the past year has shown a steep decline. It's not the update the province wants to hear. Since 2012, cod stocks have been showing improvements, but over the past year, that's changed. New research from DFO says stocks are down 30 percent, and one of the biggest reasons for that drop is natural mortality. These large increases in natural mortality can happen, and um, they're very hard to predict. And, but we do have external evidence that says that maybe, you know, there isn't a lot of uh, capelin and uh, shrimp, which are food sources for cod. DFO expects stocks to keep going down. Scientist Karen Dwyer says changes in the ecosystem can be unpredictable and can alter projections. It was projected to increase this year. If something changes from year to year, your projections are not going to bear out. And that's what happened in this case. It's not only natural causes contributing to the decline. Since 2015, more fish are being caught. This is a reminder that where we are in that critical zone, it's, it's a very uh, precarious place to be and we have to be careful with uh, all sources of removal. The Groundfish Enterprise Allocation Council says today's news means there's not a lot of fish being born and too many dying. The council says the spawning stock biomass is below where it was when the moratorium was called in 1992. And while ecosystem changes are contributing to the problem, the only thing to help the situation is monitor the fishery and keep fish in the water to fuel the next recovery. Janelle Kelly, CBC News, St. John's. There's another stalemate in efforts to restart the forestry industry in Botwood. Minister Jerry Byrne shared that news at a government event this afternoon in Grand Falls, Windsor. He says the government has been unable to reach a deal with Bulk Logistics. That's the UK company that wanted timber rights once held by Abitibi. It was promising to build a new sawmill on the Botwood Highway, possibly breathing new life into the town's harbour. But Byrne says the company isn't ready to sign a government offer. Unfortunately, neither a business plan nor an agreement on a 60,000 cubic meter allocation was readily to be signed by the company itself. We're open for business. We'll continue to work with bulk logistics and others, but it's really, really important that we move incrementally so that we offer an opportunity for investment, but at the same time, we don't lock up incredibly valuable fiber and forest inventory for a very, very long period of time and not have that fiber utilized. Health officials are struggling to explain how a 14-year-old from Nain died of tuberculosis. Gussie Bennett died Sunday after first presenting at the clinic in Nain last Friday with TB-related symptoms. The province is investigating whether more could have been done for Bennett. Officials can't say how Bennett contracted the disease, but they're offering his family and others who may have had contact with him tuberculosis screening. Being contacted because um, you're offered screening, I would really strongly advise people to come forward. Um, it is definitely worth it because in the first instance, you might have, the, you might have been exposed, your body might be reacting, but you might not know it. You might be well. Um, but we can tackle it then and prevent the disease from, from developing further. Remember that tuberculosis is spread through close contact with infected individuals. Symptoms include persistent cough, chest pain, fever, fatigue, and loss of appetite. Tuberculosis can be treated and cured. If Nain residents are concerned that they or a loved one may have signs of tuberculosis, they should report immediately to the Nain Clinic. Well, tomorrow is World Tuberculosis Day, and the federal government is promising to eliminate TB in Inuit communities by the year 2030. But the challenge will be greatest in this province. Nunatsiavut currently has more instances of active TB infections than anywhere else in the country, with an average rate of 248.8 active infections per 100,000 people. 
Another big skating day for Olympic bronze medalist Caitlin Osmond. The Marystown native is one of 24 skaters competing in the free skate at this year's World Figure Skating Championships in Milan, Italy. After this skate, Osmond is heading home for a series of stadium performances, including in the Marystown Arena named in her honour. CBCNL will be there to bring you the special moment next month. So sad to see him leave us. Uh, he was such a big presence in our lives. They say he was the force behind their musical success. Up next, the Ennis sisters talk about their father who passed away this week. It affects your wallet and our province's future. And on Tuesday, the province is bringing down its budget and we'll be here to deliver it to you. What's cut and what's not, it's an important budget. Join us here in the lobby of the Confederation Building at 2 o'clock island time on Tuesday. We'll report live on Facebook and CBC Radio 1. So get your questions to us on Facebook and by using the hashtag NLBudget2018 on Twitter. That's 2 p.m. on Tuesday. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, their sound is unmistakable. Three sisters whose harmonies have entertained us since they were little girls. The Anna sisters have received awards and accolades over the years, and they give a lot of credit for their musical success to their father, John, who passed away this week. I chatted with the sisters this afternoon. 
And Karen, Maureen, and Teresa join me now. I just want to, first of all, uh, extend condolences from all of us here. How are you all doing? Uh, we're doing uh, pretty oh, good. Man. You yeah. know, um, this has been a long time coming. And, um, you know, we're, we're all sort of uh, relieved that um, that he's no longer suffering. So yeah. it's it's kind of like a, a relief and a grief. Yeah. You know, it's uh, we we're s so sad to see him leave us. Uh, he was such a m big presence in our lives, and um, but we're relieved that he's no longer tormented. Louis body uh, dementia is devastating, um, and you know the last couple of years have been uh, challenging to say the least. And uh, to see him now at peace is just a relief to us to know that he's okay. And Teresa, I understand you three sang him out the day yeah. he passed. Every day that we visited him uh, while he was staying in the hospital for the last um, three weeks, we sang to him at some point. Yeah. Um, and uh, we made sure, Maureen made up a, uh, a list on her iPhone and, and we were playing all of, his fa all of his favorite songs to him. Music is a gift that he gave us and uh, he was so passionate about uh, songs and storytelling and he's but an accordion and for as long as I can remember, um, you know, every day he played his button accordion. Come on then, it's your turn to play a tune. I remember at times in my life being so annoyed by that and thinking one of these days I'm going to miss that, you know, and, uh, and that day is here. <laughs> yeah, it's when we went in and we saw his chair and the accordions by his chair and realized that he's not going to play those anymore. There was definitely a losing your breath moment, you know, yeah. that, you know, and you know, the power of music was yeah. something that was quite evident through this whole journey. That's right. yeah. um, it was one thing when, when he, we called them episodes, he'd have an episode, and we'd all gather with him at the house with mom, and we would sing, we would play, we would get him to play, we would get up and dance with him, and that would calm him, and it would kind of bring him back to reality. So um, yeah, it's very powerful. I want to take you back a little bit. Uh, family and music has been... Uh, so much part of your life. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting you in Halifax <laughs> when I was up working. You were girls and yeah. you were there with your mom and dad. You had been performing somewhere in the uh, Nova Scotia area. How important was it for you to have the influence of your mom and your dad? Well, it was amazing really because they truly had our best interests at heart and they didn't want to see anybody coming in before we were ready um, and making these decisions and signing us up to a contract and making mistakes that were going to set us up for, you know, years of, uh, you know, wasting time and, and, and decisions that we couldn't get back. We were also caught up in all the excitement and it was really nice that they uh, kept level heads to the whole thing and, you know, Dad always, no matter what, looked after our business. Um, right up until he couldn't anymore, investing our money and making sure that we made the right choices in our company. We've been uh, a part of this company for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, and he also helped influence the songs we wrote. And, you know, he'd say to us, if your ticket costs $50, give them a $100 show. <laughs> and, you know, our names were very important and, the, and our word was extremely important. And we carried that through um, in our business and in our daily lives. Um, and family was everything. And the place, Newfoundland and Labrador, where we're from, was everything. So he instilled all that in us, and uh, we're going to continue making him proud. You mentioned his accordion mm -hmm. and how he loved to play. And your roots go back to traditional Newfoundland slash Irish music. Mm -hmm. You experimented over the years, but you seem to have come back to your roots. I'm just wondering now, when you're writing and playing do you hear his voice? Always, always. There's not a thing. This whole record uh, that we have coming out now, June 15th, which is almost, uh, it's bizarre because we didn't choose that date uh, for any particular reason, but it is his birthday weekend and Father's Day weekend. And it's a tribute. Now we had to go back because of our father's passing and uh, have a special uh, on our artwork on the CD to a tribute to our dad. And we're going to hold on to all the things that he gave us. And you know, this is a record I think he'd be very, very proud of. And Dad, it was it was amazing. He was a power engineer, <laughs> and at Newfoundland, at Newfoundland, Newfoundland Power, power yeah. thirty-seven years. But when he retired, he didn't know anything about the music industry. 
but he loved us so much and he wanted us to do so well because it was our dream and passion that he learned everything he had to know about the music industry and he managed us for several years and with um, this business there's so many ups and downs and like even through the downs of it he was there to say you can do this and refocus us and get us back on track and um, we were able to follow our dreams and our passions just because of his support and love and mom of course mm -hmm. what does it mean to you to be able to look at that archival footage with your dad there. Oh, it's, it's very emotional. It, it's very emotional. Um, I was saying earlier to Maureen and Karen that, you know, through this Lewy body dementia disease that dad developed, um, you know, we kind of got used to that new person, you know, and, and having to kind of take on the caregiver role and make sure we were there. And But going back and seeing those, you know, that old footage and, and going through the old photos, you know, um, it just, reminds us again of who he was and he was such a passionate person for life and uh, and he loved his family he was a true gentleman yeah, he really he was, was. Yeah. Uh, and i don't know of anyone who had a bad word to say about him no. and which is so nice now to see all the tributes coming in and it's uh it's very emotional to read them but it's um it's so special for the family to be able to know that he impacted so many people I can't get over how many things he inspired or, you know, somehow was there. I remember the exact moment. It was so important to have his opinion on what that song sounded like. And, and he's a part of every note of what we do. And it's and his pride, I got to say about his pride, <laughs> yeah. even through this whole journey. I mean, he, was, he always uh, spoke highly of us, but the last several years, um, no matter who it was, he would go up and say, I'm the father of the Anna sisters. Do you know the Anna sisters? And he would just, he would even sometimes not who, know who we were, and he would brag about his daughters to us. Yeah. He was so proud and yeah. so... Well, we were going along saying, we're so proud to be John and his daughters. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to hear you talk about somebody who was so special to you, influenced yeah. you, loved you, you loved him. It's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for you. having us here to talk about him. They're so lovely. Yes, yeah, sweet. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, the funeral mass for John Ennis uh, will be held on Monday morning at Corpus Christi Church here in St. Yeah, John's. Very likable women and then, uh, such great singers. Beautiful. <laughs> After 42 years of teaching dance, Judy Nee has decided to slow down her dance tempo. Coming up after the break, we'll dip into her career. Don't drop me. I'll try not to.
Carolyn joining us with her first full look at the weather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was anything but uh, spring in Cornerbrook today. Just take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Slush covered roads, closed schools on the west coast, and in parts of central, imagine close to 20 centimeters fell overnight. And today in the hilly city, ugh. residents spent most of the day snow blowing and shoveling, making those snow banks even bigger. And don't put the shovel away yet. There are more flurries in the forecast for tonight. There. Right, Carolyn? Yes, <laughs> there is. And uh, what a contrast. Looking at uh, these uh, pictures here, this video compared to St. John's today. I with know. the sunshine and, and the warm temperatures, yeah. it got up to uh, 10 degrees in St. John's. We almost broke the record for the warmest day on this date. Yeah, uh, it was well, gorgeous. Yeah. 1984 was the record, 10.2. So that's close. Close. Yeah. Let's have a look yeah. at some of the highs for today. Yeah, St. John's was the hot spot in the province today at 10 degrees. As you continued west, things definitely cooled down a lot as uh, as the, the snowfall and the flurries uh, moved through. So this is the weather on the way headlines. Uh, Saturday, we're looking at a lot of flurries on the island, but Labrador is looking very nice this weekend. Cool, but quiet. Uh, and Monday, things really start to clear off for everyone in the province. This is the situation right now. This is uh, the snowfall that's uh, affecting that part of the island. And there is still a snowfall warning in effect for the Green Bay, White Bay area and Northern Peninsula East. About five to 10 more centimeters uh, expected to fall before things start to taper off into flurries overnight tonight. And you can see here in Labrador, lots of flurries happening there this evening. And as well on the island in the east, there's a chance we could see some flurries or uh, uh, some drizzle as well. Uh, so yeah, for the Island flurry action pretty much everywhere tonight, and the same story for uh, Labrador. And the winds ramping up as well on the west coast there. So, Saturday, how is that looking? Well, the flurries they cleared out, but then it all starts to move in again and, and things start to uh, to ramp up a bit more uh, for parts of the island, but clearing off nicely in Labrador. Uh, some morning flurries there, but as the day progresses, things will get quite nice. But you can see here there, there are a lot of flurries uh, on the island and uh, in the east. We won't see that until probably late afternoon. So. If you're in St. John's, this is what you can expect in the morning. Mainly cloudy sky, zero as the high there. Uh, as we get into the afternoon, it'll go up to about two or three degrees and we won't see those flurries or that drizzle until late afternoon into the evening. And then it starts to get very windy as well. And that wind is going to continue on Sunday. So this is the picture for the rest of the province. You can see very similar story, a uh, chance of some flurries or some showers in the Clarenville area. Five more centimeters of snow expected in the Grand Falls, Windsor Bay, Burt area tomorrow. So it's going to be windy and it's going to be very snowy there tomorrow on the West Coast. Not quite as much snow, about two to four centimeters expected there as well as up in the Straits. So uh, if you're in uh, the western part of Labrador, you'll see some of those morning flurries, but then it'll start to clear off and temperature is much cooler there. Lab City looking at minus eight as the high. So Saturday night into Sunday for most people, things are looking quite nice as we head into Sunday, but in the east and in parts of central, we are looking at some more flurries and some high winds, 75 there in St. John's and St. Lawrence. So I'll uh, have more of those details coming up later. Thanks, Carolyn. Judy Nee was a dance instructing pioneer when she opened her studio in St. John's in the late 1970s. Now, after 42 years of teaching thousands of people how to cut a rug with new moves, she's making a move of her own. She's selling the studio. I met up with Judy Nee to tap our toes and have a chat about her lengthy career and her passion for dance. Judy Nee, big decision. You're going to sell this building, which you've had for four 37 decades, years. Right? Yeah. Why, why are you selling? Well, I've had my studio for 42 years. I turned 65 this year, so I figured I haven't got a lot of time left um, to, to do uh, traveling and pick up some other hobbies and things that I want to do. So I'm going to cut back. So I want to sell the building, hopefully, 
and then maybe have some classes in another location. Okay, so you're or, still going to be teaching a little bit? Yes, just not the full-fledged schedule that I do now. Okay, so you start your left foot, box, forward, side, close, back, side, close, left, side. So how old were you when you got into dancing? I was four when I started dancing. And so you, Age four. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided the you were going to do this? Uh, uh, no, it actually was my grandmother who decided that I was to dance. She loved, uh, she lived in New York for a while and uh, she used to watch the Broadway shows down there with all the tap dancing. Right. So she signed me up for tap dancing first at age four. Right, so you've been dancing for 61 years. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, I guess you can be forgiven if you want to slow down a little bit. I think so. How did the, uh, your arrival on the the St. John's dance scene, how did it affect the place? Because I've spoken, you, you, you've taught thousands and thousands of people over those years to dance, there's of all been, ages. Yes, there's been thousands, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many thousands that have come through the doors for the past 42 years, from age three up to 63, 73, whatever. Um, so there's been many. What have you taken the most satisfaction from as a, as a teacher of dance? Well, all the teacher training students have been excellent but I get a lot of pleasure out of the person with two left feet I really do um, <laughs> the person yeah, that's right. <laughs> left foot forward right foot forward side close no the person that really doesn't know how to dance and they really feel embarrassed they don't feel like they can go out to a function and, and they're embarrassed to get up on the dance floor mm -hmm. they are the happiest person that when they discover how they can do just the smallest thing. Right. And mm -hmm. how many people have you had who've actually been with you for more than just a few years? You, I've you... actually had two people that have been with me for the whole 42 years. Really? Yes. Just two. Are they relatives? Oh. No. <laughs> side, close. Oh. Back, side, close. Forward, side, close. A lot of footsteps on these uh, hardwood floors here. It must, must have a lot of memories. This floor has had to be redone about three or four times over the 37 years in this building. Good use. Yeah. Back, side, close. But when I first started in 76, when I had my first ballroom class, there might have been about two men in the class. And the two men were wore out because they had, this, they had to dance with all the women. So it wasn't easy. So over the years, it was a gradual process that eventually the men started to come. And now I don't have any trouble with men coming. Well, what are you going to miss the most as you walk away from this, mostly? I'm going to miss all the people that I meet, and many of them have become my friends. They're not just teacher students, uh, especially the ones that have been here for a long time. We're friends. So it's the friendships that have built over all these years. Mm -hmm. Just about everybody I know is all connected to the dance world, and it's a wonderful world to be in. <laughs> Close, back. You're going to keep making friends? Well, I have no yes, I, indeed I am. And good luck in your retirement. Thank you, semi-retirement. Thank you very much. You're really good. <laughs> What a yep. wonderful career. Her name is anonymous mm -hmm. with dance here. Yep. I, I made some mistakes during the interview. I kept calling her Judy Foote by oh, mistake dear. because Judy Foote's in the news. <laughs> but anyhow, my apologies at Judy Knee. But she's invited us to go and, you know, show uh, our stuff. Oh. Did you? I made a date for us. What did she think? Are, are you lost she, cause she or no, there's hope? She, she told me I had improved. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> That whole experience was such a roller coaster of emotions, but the fact that everybody was willing to do it for me just says a lot about how amazing of a school and community it is. A broken leg derailed a local high school's musical, but everybody's cutting loose and getting footloose tonight. Some inspiring teens coming up next on Here and Now.
Welcome back once again. Well, a little, little patience, tenacity, and being quick on their feet is paying off for Mount Pearl High School. O'Donnell delayed the opening of their musical Footloose. This after the lead actor took the theater expression, break a leg, <laughs> a little too literally. The show opens tonight at Holy Heart Theater in St. John's with some very creative choreography. Like the old adage is, uh, break a leg, uh, but it, unfortunately for us, it was quite literal. Uh, our lead actor, Andrew Heptich, uh, broke his leg about a week before we were supposed to open. And so uh, we kind of scrambled to figure out what we were going to do because, uh, you know, we were a school. And being a school, we wanted to be inclusive. And Andrew's just a fabulous actor. So uh, we made the necessary changes to get him in the show. And uh, we couldn't be happier. It was such a devastating feeling because I didn't, I wasn't even sad because I couldn't do the show. I was like, I've let everybody down. Like, oh, I'm so selfish. Like, how could I do something so stupid? I think it really brought us closer together. I mean, we never had this energy that we have right now. We've never been so excited. And yeah, we really feel like a family now. That whole experience was such a roller coaster of emotions. But the fact that everybody was willing to do it for me just says a lot about how amazing of a school and community it is. I'm almost going to come to tears because uh, he's just a phenomenal student. You know, he uh, and, and, and the rest of them, they are just great, great students. Now that's my mama. Oh, isn't that great? Well, this year's BMO Winterset Award has been handed out, and Joel Thomas Hines takes the prize for his book, We'll All Be Burnt in Our Beds Some Night. The award celebrates excellent writing in this province and comes with a $12,500 prize. Finalists Bridget Canning and Wayne Johnston each get $3,000. And on the music front, we've got some people from this province to watch. In the Junos on Sunday night, Amelia Curran, Matt Marr, and Andrew Staniland are all nominated.
Let's meet our Young Athlete of the Day. Tonight, we're giving a shout out to Mackenzie Turpin from Labrador City, who proves you don't have to be involved in organized sports to be an athlete. 12 year old Mackenzie focuses her abilities on dance. We have a lot of dance on the show tonight. <laughs> yes, uh, it's she's a been, theme. Yeah, she's been dedicated to studying jazz dance for the past six years and works hard to constantly challenge herself. Great outfit for a dance uh, finale. Nice. Yeah, way to go, Mackenzie. Congratulations on being today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. You're right, we even got to see a jig during the Ennis Sisters it's, interview. Yeah, so true. it was your dance. It's a yeah. musical, artistic theme going here on Here and Now. Tonight. So I expect a pirouette when you head over. To the <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going to disappoint <laughs> for sure. And uh, yeah, so I thought I'd start with uh, the current temperatures right now sure. in the province. Uh, going down and down and down. I hope you guys got out to enjoy a bit of the sunshine yeah, and nice. the warm temperatures today. No? <laughs> no, it was a lovely day for a walk. There'll but. be more. Yes, there will be. We're on our way. <laughs> so this is uh, how temperatures are looking right now in St. John's. We've gone from that lovely 10 degrees down to two degrees, zero in Badger, three in Stephenville, much cooler in Labrador, minus nine in Maine, and uh, cooler still with that uh, uh, wind chill. Just notice that the snowfall warning uh, for uh, the Green Bay White Bay area has been lifted, but still in place for the northern peninsula east. That literally just happened. So five to 10 centimeters of snow expected uh, there tonight before it starts to taper off into flurries overnight. And we have lots of flurries there in Labrador for tonight and into tomorrow as well in the Gander area area and Badgers. So tomorrow we're looking at a pretty uh, or lots of flurries on the island tomorrow clearing off in Labrador but yeah it's gonna be a bit blustery and lots of flurries we won't see it there in the east until later in the afternoon so then things uh, start to clear out on Sunday. We'll get to that in just a moment. So this is the picture for your Saturday. A chance of some uh, flurries or showers in the Clarenville Bonavista area uh, and a chance of some late day flurries in the east as well as uh, about five more centimeters expected in the Bay Vert, uh, Grand Falls, Windsor area uh, and up along the northern peninsula there. So for Labrador, as I mentioned, morning flurries, then things should clear out very, very nicely, and you're in for a lovely but cool Saturday. Uh, for Sunday, some of the flurries start to clear out for most of the island. Lovely, clear skies in Labrador there, but in the east, those flurries will uh, linger and persist, and the winds are going to ramp up a lot as well. So Sunday, it's going to be uh, lots of flurries in the east and very, very windy for everyone on the island, but another very nice day for Labrador. So we're looking at flurries and winds in central and the east. Sun and cloud on the west. Temperatures not too bad. Sun and cloud in Labrador for Sunday. Now, as we head into Monday, we all get a nice break from, uh, from the weather. Things really start to clear off. You can see nothing is really happening. We're here Monday, 1 o'clock, clear skies right across the board. So, and winds not too bad as well. So nice light winds and uh, clear skies as you begin your work week. So sun and cloud across the board. Temperatures not too bad. Four degrees on the west coast on Monday, so that will be very nice. And this will continue into Tuesday as well. So we'll have two days where everyone will be seeing some nice weather. But then as we get into Wednesday and Thursday, you can see this system starting to move in uh, and we'll bring some snow and some rain to the island. So you have two days to get out and really enjoy the weather before we get another system moving in. And Friday is looking, I mean, it's still, still pretty far out so things could definitely change but right now Friday is looking very nice for sure uh, and in Labrador Tuesday Wednesday won't see really anything until Thursday so yeah you have one two three four wonderful days to enjoy Debbie thanks Carolyn in national and international news tonight there's an old joke that Ottawa rolls up sidewalks and shuts down at five o'clock 
That wasn't true last night in the House of Commons. The Conservatives staged a filibuster, keeping the debate going all night long. All night long. <laughs> Oh, oh dear, that is Liberal MP René Massé singing Lionel Richie's song. Conservatives had threatened to keep MPs in the House for 40 hours, but stopped this afternoon. They want the Prime Minister's National Security Advisor to testify to Parliament about what he knew of the Jaspal Atwal scandal. He's the man convicted of attempted murder who was invited to a diplomatic party during the PM's India trip. China says it does not want a trade war with the United States, but it isn't afraid to engage in one. That's the response to Donald Trump's announcement that the United States plans to impose tariffs worth billions of dollars. CBC Asia correspondent Sasha Petrasik reports. Beijing was clearly prepared for this American move, and its response came quickly. It urged Washington to pull back from the brink and avoid taking U.S.-China affairs into what it calls a dangerous place one that could affect far more than the half-trillion-dollar trading relationship between the two countries. The Chinese ambassador to Washington had a stern message. As far as a possible trade war is concerned, we never wanted to start. But if somebody imposes a trade war on us, we'll fight to the end. Indeed, China is in a combative mood, perhaps more confident and more nationalistic than ever before. And that's been stoked by Chinese President Xi Jinping. He says China will back down for no one. Today, state media say that U.S. President Donald Trump was just in a panic over China's economic rise. In any case, for now, China is imposing some $3 billion in new tariffs on U.S. imports, food mostly, pork, wine and fruit, as well as steel and aluminum. But in a sign of the mood here, if you look at the Internet, it is full of comments that this response is just simply not tough enough. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Beijing. Three people are dead after a gunman took hostages at a supermarket in France. French media say the suspect is connected to ISIS. It happened in the south of France. Police say the attacker hijacked a car and killed one person inside the vehicle. The gunman then shot at a group of police officers before taking hostages at a nearby grocery store. Two more people were shot dead at the store. A standoff lasted for hours until police stormed the supermarket and killed the attacker. The president of France says it does appear to be a terror attack. Back in this country now, Gerald Stanley is making a pitch to tell his story in a book. A jury acquitted Stanley last month in the shooting death of Colton Bushy. But so far, Stanley has had little success getting a publisher, and one company has taken the unusual step of denouncing the request in a press release. Olivia Stefanovich reports. Gerald Stanley hasn't been heard from since he was whisked away by the RCMP moments after being acquitted in Colton Bushy's shooting death. Despite multiple attempts to contact Stanley, it appears he's trying to get his views out another way. The Toronto-based publishing house Between the Lines received a request from Stanley's legal team this week to tell his side of the story. It rejected the offer and is encouraging other publishers to do the same. Given the limited resources there are uh, for publications, how much time and energy it takes, really think long and hard about whether this is the right thing to do. The publishing company says sharing Stanley's story would allow him to gain financially from Bushi's death and contribute to the injustices experienced by all Indigenous people, especially Bushi's family. That's the mission of our publishing house is to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And there are few other people hurting more than that family, so we want to stand with them. In an email statement to CBC News, Stanley's lawyer Scott Spencer says his client isn't looking for a book deal, nor is Stanley's legal team also acting as his literary agents. Rather, Spencer says Stanley just wants to set the record straight. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Regina. Well, here's today's viewer photo of the day. Interesting sight. Does it look familiar? 
-hmm. No, but it's yeah. sure interesting. It Look is. at that tree growing out of that big rock. solid rock. <laughs> I'll tell you where this photo was taken after the break. Once again, well, St. John's East MP Nick Whalen is continuing his tradition of colorful reactions. Mm -hmm. From channeling Pierre Elliott Trudeau's fuddle-duddle when he got elected to that memorable, over-exaggerated eye roll in the House of Commons. To this, during that all-night filibuster in the House of Commons we told you about, the Liberal MP was energetic, pumping his fists there after one vote. Yeah, so he was fist-pumping, and then to continue our dancing theme, he was dabbing. There you go. Uh, a few chuckles from some MPs uh, dabbing. It's, well, it's that dance move that he just showed off, and it caught on pretty quick. <laughs> oh, dear. They're all tired. <laughs> yeah. Filibusters do that. Some very precious cargo headed west today. Four giant pandas who have been on loan to Toronto Zoo from China since 2013 are relocating to Calgary. <laughs> A FedEx convoy picked them up this morning. Uh, two of the embarrassment of pandas. Yes, that's the actual term for a group of pandas. Oh. I had no idea. <laughs> Me either. Uh, they were twin cubs born in Canada, and you're looking at some memories from their five years in Toronto. The family are on their way to a new multi-million dollar residence at the Calgary Zoo. Toronto zookeepers sent them off with plenty of bamboo and apples. They'll be loaded onto a Boeing 757 with their handlers who are traveling with them. They're on loan to Calgary for the next five years. So they get around every five they years. They certainly do. <laughs> Beautiful animals. Absolutely lovely. So it is Friday, mm. and uh, that means we'd like to show you who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 90th birthday to Ida Sullivan of Calvert. Happy 90th birthday as well to Belinda Hutchings, formerly of Cowhead, now in Bombay. Happy 94th birthday to Mary Ann Nan Whedon, whose special day is today. Happy 90th birthday to Katie Buzan of Bishop's Falls, who is an avid hockey fan and loves her Montreal Canadiens. Birthday wishes to twins, Alice Clark of Paradise and Mabel Mabs Daw of Conception Bay South. They will be 96 years old this coming Monday. 
Happy 97th birthday to Olive Yetman of Mount Pearl celebrating her birthday tomorrow. Olive is a war bride who arrived in St. John's in 1946. Happy 92nd birthday to Rosemary Whalen in Cornerbrook, still living in her own home. And a happy 90th birthday to Mabel Oxford in Lansamoor, currently in Cornerbrook. Happy birthday to Helen Walsh from Deer Lake. Helen will be 96 this Sunday. Daisy and Cyril Clark in Pinsent's Arms celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary on March the 15th. And a happy 50th anniversary to John and Ruby McGonigal celebrating this Sunday. They are in St. Anthony. Congratulations to Boyce and May Vivian of Hare Bay who celebrated their 56th anniversary yesterday. Happy 62nd wedding anniversary to Garland and Stella Perry of Cornerbrook coming up on the 28th. Happy 50th anniversary to Doug and Donna Barfit of Clarenville. Happy 50th wedding anniversary greetings to Gar and Marjorie Chant of Gander, formerly of Channel Port of Basque, whose anniversary was on the 19th. Happy 90th birthday to Louise Jarrett of Greens Pond, now in New West Valley. Happy birthday to Eileen Arnold, Eileen Arnold rather, of Traytown, now in Glovertown, who will celebrate her 95th birthday on the 28th. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Reverend Jim and Rita Pollard, who are celebrating their golden anniversary today. Birthday greetings going out to Greta Rose from Buren, who turns 90 this Sunday. She is currently in Grand Bank. Mary Slaney in St. Lawrence turns 96 years of age on March the 28th. Happy birthday to you. And a happy 53rd anniversary to Majors Fred and Winnie Randall in Birchie Bay. They celebrate on the 26th. Also celebrating on the 26th, a happy 67th wedding anniversary to Patrick and Marguerite Whalen in Pasadena. A happy 50th wedding anniversary to William Ann Lush in St. John's. And happy and happy 90th birthday to Lydia Hiscock from Victoria, who celebrates this Sunday. Fine okay. crowd. Occasionally yes. we make the odd mistake yes. in announcing these. You caught it? Yeah, you might have noticed we had a 65th anniversary there for Daisy and Cyril Clark in Pinson's Arms. So we said 65, but I think it said they were celebrating their 96th, 96th anniversary. <laughs> Gotta and, be a record. <laughs> yeah, I certainly hope you get there. But uh, anyway, apologies for that, but congratulations to everybody. Yes. Well, let's have a look at our viewer photo of the day. Anyone know where this uh, could be? It's oh. so interesting. It is. That's a that's a tough little tree for sure. And this is Little Harbor East on the Buren Peninsula. Wouldn't wow. have gotten it. No, yeah. it does look uh, kind of like it does look like a, bon a bonsai, bonsai, a bonsai bon tree. Yeah. yeah. It does look like one. And uh, thank you very much to Mina <laughs> Thibault for uh, posting that on Ryan's Facebook page. And she mentioned that lots of people go to, to visit mm -hmm. that site to, just to see that rock with the tree on it. So it's a bit of a, an attraction in the area. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. <laughs> so Ryan's going to be back on Monday. Yes, he is. And yeah. um, I'm going away for the next couple of weeks. So Musical you're going chairs. to be here and Ryan will be back. So. Mm -hmm. See you in a couple weeks. We're all jealous. You're yeah, going to well, take a little bit of R and R, but well rest. deserved. Yep. Yes. Dance and lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Took the good out of you. He made his mind to go tomorrow. After that, anyway, we've had a, a lot of fun. Hope you've enjoyed our program. Have a great weekend, and some of us will be back here on Monday. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good one.